Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is it okay? All right. Okay, so I decided rather than immediately starting with what I had planned, so actually a little bit on differential operators, ODEs and PDEs, I'm going to return to fretum operators because in the last lecture an interesting question arose about some of their, uh, actually about the definition. And so I thought, well, why not take the opportunity and make this absolutely clear what's going on there. So this is something you saw last time, but I have a few pages afterwards which are new. Um, we start, so this is the slightly more general situation where we have a two Hilbert space uh, context. And again, I, I'd like to point out that's more than just uh, generality. When you have unbounded freedom operators, you often want to work with the graph Hilbert space rather than the original Hilbert space, which renders the operator bounded. And as a result, is technically much simpler. So this is more than just a just generalization. It's actually quite useful, and this is why the graph Hilbert space was mentioned at the beginning. So once again, if we have an operator S that's closed, and at that point I was densely defined, then you also assume that the range is closed and that the two dimensions, the one of the kernel of S and the kernel of S star, are both finite. If that's the case, the freedom index is of course defined as the difference of these two dimensions. Okay. That was last time. Now I'm going to show you something else. So here is a, if you want, slightly different and more general approach. So you still start with two Hilbert spaces. Uh, you are not assuming that to be densely defined, so just assume to be closed. You do assume the range is closed, and you assume now that the dimension of the kernel of S and the core dimension of S is finite. Co-dimension is, is basically what's missing in the image of S in H2. What's the dimension of H2 quotient range of S. So again, this does not assume that S is densely defined. Co-dimension comes under other names. You find the, the name defect frequently, sometimes you even call it co-rank. So all those notions in the literature mean the same thing, namely this definition here. Now, again, you would do the following. So if uh, the operator follows those three conditions, so this is Fredholm in a slightly more general context, you would say the index is the dimension of the null space minus now the co-dimension. Okay. So the question is, what's the relation between these objects? And it's uh, interesting. So here's actually a statement that it's very useful when you want to know whether or not your range is already closed in the Hilbert space. And so it turns out that if you have a closed operator, I'm not assuming even it's densely defined and I'm still, all these operators are unbounded. All it requires is the defect, or uh, I should have said co-dimension because I used mostly co-dimension in the previous uh, slide. So let's go back for a second. So defect is the same as uh, co-dimension here, okay? So the idea is, if that's finite, you're actually closed. Again, this has nothing to do with boundedness or densely defined, so this is more general. So in particular, if you know you have a closed operator and the range is not closed, your defect or the co-dimension will be infinite. And now I can show you an example which shows that indeed one has to be very careful in how to define the index. So here's an example where the dimension of the kernel of S star is zero, as you will see, but the defect, so the co-dimension, is infinite. So it couldn't be farther apart uh, because what we discussed last time, there was an implicit assumption it would make no difference if the operator is bounded. It's not true. So this, and in fact, boundedness is also not an issue in this context either, because there's no assumption of boundedness in this, uh, in this result. So anyway, the example is like this. Take an operator, densely defined, 
now I need it densely defined because I'm talking about the air joint. I cannot talk about the air joint without it being densely defined. Closed, of course, we always had that. And now I'm assuming that the range is dense, but not closed. Okay? In that case, we know already because uh, the range is not closed, you must have defect infinity. On the other hand, if you look at uh, the kernel of S star, it's just the range of S perpendicular. But since the range is dense, being perpendicular means you get just a zero vector. As a result, the dimension of this space is of course zero, whereas the other dimension is infinite. So one really has to be careful in what, what, what setup one works. Um, I have maybe a little more about this. Yes, so here's a summary of when all the both versions fit nicely together. So the slightly more restrictive version I discussed last time and the more general version. So let's, yes. Edmonds and Evans. That's a, that's a, a wonderful book on PDs. I added it to uh, my reference list. And then by the way, everything I said so far, except for the example, in the example, I took life easy with orthogonal complement. So if you make a, a cut here, everything works for Banach spaces. No difference. But the example here uses orthogonal complement. So here I'm in a Hilbert space. But you could surely cook up a similar example in a Banach space. Uh, so I'll, I'll come to the literature. So anyway, here's a theorem that puts all the definitions we had last time and this time together. And they're all nicely consistent. So here's what you do. You, you, you want to be densely defined, otherwise you can't talk about an R joint. You want to be closed, that's always the case. And let's assume the dimension of the kernel and the defect or co-dimension is finite. Then in fact the range is closed, so you don't have to worry about this. And you can define the index by this difference, this difference, or this difference. This is the one I'm mostly interested in because I rather work with self-adjoint non-negative operators. Okay, So this sort of puts it all together. And uh, uh, that, that's the new part. So I, I took this now from a new version of my part two. So this is actually now in incorporated in part two. It has nothing to do with today's talk. But I, that's why it says now we return to <laughs> the original definition. Anyway, so this is, uh, this is the full story about this. So one indeed has to be very careful what definitions one, uh, one uses. Let me make just one more comment. I don't want to go through all of this again, but I want to remind you of the product formula. I guess I missed it. So where is it? Oh, or well, maybe I didn't repeat it here. Yeah, so I guess I didn't. Re oh, you see it? Oh yeah, there it is. So for instance, here's an interesting uh, little twist. If you want this formula, if you use the new definition, which does not require densely defined, you don't need any assumptions but the two operators to be fed on in this more generalized sense, then the product formula holds. Whereas here, I I'm went back to my old version, I have to assume T and S is densely defined. Okay, So there are all sorts of subtleties, and if you apply these things, you better check very carefully what definitions is someone using in this context. Okay, Now let me go to the literature a little. So this is, we have seen all that, this was last time. Here is uh, that reference I just uh, mentioned. So this one, this particular theorem that Hermann asked about is in this, uh, uh, the whole section of one three is about freedom operators. And it is a very, very, very nice presentation. Also, these guys take no prisoners, so they don't worry about bounded operators. They do everything immediately in the unbounded case. Okay, so that was from last time. Now we go back to what I really wanted to talk about today. So the first part is about, maybe I, I return quickly to the very beginning. So I will talk in this first part about boundary data maps for stum level operators. We'll uh, have some applications, the sp current spectral shift function at the very end will figure prominently. And in the last part, I'd like to do something that's at first is a bit more abstract, but then can be applied to PDs. So let's see how this goes and how far we can go. In any case, I have to, I, again, I have a lot more material than I can possibly uh, handle. 
so we'll have to cut it short some at some places so again my offer interrupt anytime even though this hardly is taken up from okay so let's go back to this boundary data maps so this is all about self-adjoint extensions and these boundary data maps are natural extensions in that in fact in some cases identically when the boundary conditions are Dirichlet and Neumann, these boundary data maps are just a Dirichlet to Neumann map. So what I have at least prepared, and we'll see how much we, we can go there. So I will discuss a little all self adjoint boundary conditions for a Schrodinger operator, or in this case actually a three coefficient Sturm-Liouville will operator on a bounded interval. That might be interesting to students anyway, so one can classify them all. I might, normally I would spend some time on the current von Neumann extension because I, I just like the subject very much and I have been involved in it for a number of years now. It's sort of the, op it's an, another extreme case in, in, in a very true sense of the world to the Friedrichs extension. In fact, all non-negative extension of a self adjoint operator that's bounded from below. On one side, a bounded, it's almost an interval. On one side, it's bounded by the Friedrichs extension. On the other one, it's bounded by the Klein von Neumann extension. Now, this interval can uh, collapse to a point. There may only be a unique non-negative extension. But in general, if your underlying symmetric operator is strictly positive, so there's an epsilon larger than zero, that the matrix elements of F, T, F are larger than epsilon times the norm of F squared. In this case, there is an interval. It cannot shrink to a point. And so the Klein and the Friedrichs extension are totally different objects in this context. So we'll, I don't know whether I have the time to do it today, but it's in the notes. So if someone wants to read about this, it will be posted soon. I want to spend a little time on Klein type resolvent formulas because after you go from there naturally to trace formulas, the spectral shift function appears naturally. So it, this is a and I don't know how much I have time to do symmetrized uh, freedom perturbation determinants. But there again, uh, in, 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 these are all very closely related topics and uh, will end up in this ODE case with the spectral shift function. Okay, let's move on. So this is a little literature. We don't need to, uh, you don't need to look at this too carefully now. It's in the notes. So it's based on these three papers. Notation is pretty much what I had before. So already twice I showed you this. The only thing to be remembered perhaps is the spectrum, the resolvent set, and if we ever close a closable operator, it gets a bar on top. Other than that, everything is standard here. Uh, I will talk again about trace ideals. So uh, it's again Cato's notation of PP, where P is between one and infinity. Uh, one and two are the most familiar ones, trace class and Hilbert Schmidt. If you're a trace class, you have a trace. If you help, you also have a determinant if you perturb the identity. And uh, uh, if I get to the symmetrized perturbation determinants, I would I would need to use modified freedom determinants for operators which are only Hilbert Schmidt and not trace class. Okay, so let's get started. Oh, I realize I've made life simple here. So I did not do the three uh, the three coefficient. Uh, Doomly will expression, it's actually just a Schrodinger expression. We, these papers that I showed you, at one point we started with uh, Schrodinger, eventually we ended up with the full Doomly will expression. Everything I'm telling you uh, today is uh, has an immediate analog to a three coefficient Doomly will expression. Uh, but maybe actually for a school like this, it's probably not a bad choice to do the simplest non trivial case, so one with just a potential. Okay, here are the domains of the maximal and the minimal operator is the usual thing, so that you map an L2 element into itself. And in order to be able to differentiate, you need some absolute continuity requirements. So important to remember, we're gonna work on a finite interval. Okay, zero to R. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you all possible self-adjoint extensions. OK, 
Okay, so let me come back for, for, for a moment to the maximal and the minimal operator. You can see, in a sense, the maximal operator is too large. It's not even symmetric, as it turns out. The minimal operator is too small. Yes, it is symmetric, but way too small, way too many boundary conditions. Four of them. It's second order for self-adjointness. You should have two. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm overdoing it, but that's natural. This is how you start the game. You work with, in, with between a minimal and, uh, and a maximal operator in the sense that your self-adjoint extensions are then either restrictions of the maximal operator by appropriate boundary conditions, which we will see immediately, or they are extensions of the minimal operator. But extensions means a few less boundary conditions than you see here. Okay? All right. So here is the uh, basically all, uh, all self-adjoint extensions you can find in this context. So they come in two, gr in, in two pieces. Either you have separated boundary conditions. You see, this only concerns the left endpoint zero, and this only con concerns the right endpoint R. There's nothing that couples the two. And then what you do is you pick a parameter theta zero and you pick a parameter theta r and you vary them between zero and pi. That's enough. At pi you are basically back to zero. And these are all self-adjoint extensions of the minimal operator we just saw, the one with all everything zero, left and right, with separated boundary conditions. So these are called separated ones. Now, that's not all. There are, of course, what's sometimes called coupled or non-separated boundary conditions. Just think of periodicity, okay? A periodic operator. So the very important case, of course, and all the non-separated ones are sitting in this formula. So they are parameterized by a matrix in SL2R, so it's uh, real coefficients and determinant plus one, that's this guy here, and the phase. There's a phase factor. Actually, if you think of periodicity or so, you would choose F the identity and phi zero. Right? That gives that gives the special case of uh, periodic operators. Antiperiodic would be F the identity, and you choose you choose what is it? Uh, yeah, here we go from 0 to 2 pi. I was worried about choosing pi because there's a restriction here. There's no such restriction. Go all the way to 2 pi. And so you would choose phi equals pi and you get the anti-periodic situation. So all those are sitting in there. By the way, the Friedrich extension I mentioned sits in this group, but the Krein von Neumann extension sits in that group. Okay, so Friedrich extension is just Dirichlet. You would choose uh, theta zero and theta r equal to zero, in which case you get a one here, you get a zero here, and you get g of zero being zero and g at r being zero. That's Dirichlet, and Dirichlet is Felix. But Krein is complicated and sits in here with a certain non-trivial matrix F, not the identity actually. So the claim is there's nothing else that's self-adjoint. Okay, so this exhausts all possible self-adjoint extensions on the interval zero on any finite interval. Yeah. Sure. Oh, I should use it. Oh, can you hear me with this microphone? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> I'm so glad. Fritz, um, the Krein von Neumann extension, um, does it, does the boundary condition depend on the interval? Yes, it does. And I will show you the boundary condition later on. I will not jump over that part. Okay. Thank it you. does depend on the interval. <coughs> okay. So, I see. So at this point, I did jump back to, I uh, see, I, I remember it was extremely will. So at this point, I made a jump. So rather than just a Schrodinger operator, you see, this is now the full blown three coefficient extremely will expression. And uh, uh, so what I just showed you is shown in, uh, in, a, in a very nice um, book by uh, Joachim Weidmann from 2003. So the same characterization we just had for the Schrodinger operator works actually for the three coefficient uh, Sturmle will expression. You have the usual assumptions here, the weight. So this now works not in L2, 
I don't know where, yeah, here it is. The standard node work in L2 with Lebesgue measure, but this function R by which you divide, that's now a weight. So this is a weighted L2 space. Otherwise, before we had R equals one, so it wasn't there. We also had P equals one, and then Q was our potential V, okay? Anyway, the usual conditions are assumed for this to work. R is positive almost everywhere, locally integrable. P is positive almost everywhere. Not P is integrable, one over P. That's a good reason for that. If you rewrite the corresponding uh, equation that's underlying this with the spectral parameter as a uh, two by two first order system, you see that it contains one over P. And for the solvability, all the coefficients need to be locally integrable. So it's one over P, not P that enters there, that needs to be locally integrable. And Q, of course, the potential. Needs to be real valued, otherwise we're not self-adjoint, no chance, and we're not even symmetric, uh, and locally integrable. Okay, so th under these conditions, you can you can do all this, what I just showed you, and um, this exhausts all possible self-adjoint extensions. Unfortunately, this book does not exist in English. It's too bad. It's, a, it's part of a two-volume project, and like the original book by Weidmann that uh, in 1980 was uh, translated, the original version by which appeared in Däubner, was German too. And so again, he wrote it in German. I don't know that anyone will ever have the energy to translate it, but it's a pity. There's a lot of material in there, in both volumes. Volume one is sort of a, I'm making propaganda here for Raphael's thesis advisor. Uh, volume one is basically the English edition, so abstract stuff. And volume two is totally devoted to ODs and PDs. Very nice, actually. A, a lot more information there than in the English edition. Anyway, so let me go to what I uh, had earlier, Krein's resolvent formula. So what is Krein's resolvent formula? Well, the idea is the following. You pick a self adjoint extension, so you have certain boundary conditions, coupled or separated, doesn't matter. Then you pick another self adjoint extension with some boundary conditions, coupled or, self or, or, or uh, se separated. Then you look at the difference of their resolvents and you would like to describe that. Okay, that's possible and this is uh, uh, something that goes back to Mark Krein. And so I'm, I'm briefly describing this here. So what's the setup? Well, the setup is you have a densely defined symmetric operator. This guy is not self-adjoint because it has finite deficiency indices. So there is something wrong with that operator. It's far from being self-adjoint. But then you take two self-adjoint extensions, A1 and A2. You want them to be what's called relatively prime. That basically means if you take the intersection of their domains, you go back to uh, A0. So I didn't talk about uh, the maximal common part. Let's ignore that uh, for the time being. So. Pick a, a Z in a row of, of intersection of the two domains, and then you, you build something like a Cayley transform. But it's not a Cayley transform because it's it's a little different. It's a C zero here and a Z, so so this is not. Uh, you, you would normally have a complex conjugate here for a Cayley transform, but we're doing this on purpose because it turns out this U is a very smart object. It maps different deficiency subspaces into each other. So I hope I have a, uh, let me take a look at the next page. Yes, okay, that's too far already. So let me, uh, let's go slowly through this then. So let's assume we have a basis for a fixed C0 of this defect subspace. You see, this is, uh, that was the word defect subspace a little earlier. That's what it is. It is the kernel of the adjoint minus a complex number. In our case, the complex number is Z0 and fixed. So let's assume these objects here are a basis. Okay? So we went to a maximal common part. So this R, the number of in linearly independent elements, is then less or equal to M, the operator we started with. Okay, then we build this uh, Cayley type transform. And now look at this. I'm going from Z0 to Z. 
How do I do that? I just apply this KD type transform to GK at C0. Uh, you can play a little around and you get a second expression for this, doesn't matter. The important part to take away from this is this is a means to go from the defect subspace at C0 to the defect subspace Z. Okay? And uh, very, very useful uh, tool, obviously. So, uh, yeah. here is then Krein's formula. You see what this sort of holds what I promised. We want to look at the difference of two resolvents for two self-adjoint extensions, A1 and A2. Okay. Now, the actual theorem says you can find a Nevenlinner Herglotz matrix. Okay, so what's a Nevenlinner Herglotz matrix? A Nevenlinner function is one that analytically maps the open ha upper half plane into itself. Very, very special property, as I just explained to one of you. And uh, why is this so interesting uh, to specular theory? Well, all while Ditchmarsh functions are Nevenlinner functions. And the Nevenlinner function has a very interesting integral representation in terms of a measure. It's almost like a Cauchy integral in terms of a measure. The measure turns out to be the spectral function of the differential operator. So it's an absolutely fundamental concept. Here I'm not talking about the spectral function of, an, of one of these self-adjoint extensions, but it is still true that the Nevenlinna function, or in this case a matrix, uh, does the following. So this is something that's analytic in the open upper half plane, complex upper half plane, with non-negative imaginary part and the imaginary part of a matrix is just matrix minus adjoint divided by 2i so it's the analog of the scalar situation okay so this is what's meant here so this has a measure representation even though i think today we won't we won't talk about this so anyway this this ma matrix p shows up here and the elements gk of z that we just uh, looked at they were defined in terms of this almost Cayley transform, if you want, show up on the right-hand side. So one of the things you should take away from this is something very interesting. The difference of resolvents of A1 and A2 is rank R. There is only R, R projections here. They're not necessarily projections, but they almost look like. They are rank 1 operators, so R of them. So this object is rank R. Yeah, but the matrix is not positive definite. Its imaginary part is non-negative. It's, it's a slight difference. In fact, this can be any self-adjoint extension, so you should not expect an order relation between them. Okay. Anyway, there is another thing that one can say about this matrix. It's, of course, fundamental. It really describes what's going on here. Um, for instance, these guys are relatively harmless. Interesting information about the spectrum of A2 that lies that is not part of the spectrum of A1. So for instance, eigenvalues, if you want to compare, you typically look at uh, poles of these coefficients. Here's so of poles of uh, the matrix where something blows up. Anyway, the inverse, so this, this matrix P satisfies a rather interesting uh, formula. So the inverse at C is related to the inverse at C prime by well, the difference is this uh, Z minus C prime times the scalar products of the G's, one taking at C prime, one taking at C bar. Okay. Now, I, you might ask, uh, when we set this up, we took a basis. Oh, well, then once we had a basis for C0, we found another one for any Z by just applying U. But is all of this basis dependent now? And of course the answer is no. So I think I will uh, I will probably go uh, faster through this. So one can show. Uh, oops, I got in the wrong direction here. So one can show that if you choose a different basis, you get a different p, and they are all similar. So there is no information lost, of course, as one would expect if this were basis dependent. It wouldn't be so interesting. Okay. 
Now let's do the following. Let me fix a self-adjoint extension as a reference operator. And I'm going to choose the Dirichlet extension. So 0, 0, that just means I put both boundary condition parameters data 0 and data r equal to 0. Then I get my Dirichlet boundary condition at either end. So that's going to be my reference operator now. And uh, I'm going to choose a basis for the uh, defect subspace, which I denote by uj now. And I fix it in a very canonical way. This 0, 1, 1, 0 is very frequently done in this game because the determinant is 1 and so on. So this is very, very convenient. And when you then apply uh, our u, of course, you go again uh, from c prime to z or from c to c prime. And in this case, uh, the almost Cayley transform, of course, is of this form with uh, the Dirichlet extension here. So another thing that uh, one can show is that this really is a bijection between these two spaces. So defect space at C prime and defect space at C. So let me take a quick look at uh, separated boundary conditions. So it turns out we can say a little more about uh, this right-hand side that you just saw abstractly in, uh, in uh, so let me, let me go back for a moment. So just to be sure, this was abstract theory. This had nothing to do with uh, differential operators. Now I'd like to uh, apply this for my uh, second order differential operators, okay? So in particular, I'd like to find these guys. What are they? So let's take a look. So we had already a setup of the defect subspace and its basis, chose it very specially. Then uh, we are able to roam around for all z's and c primes by applying this almost Cayley transform. And so here is actually a very concrete uh, representation of these crime type resolvent formulas. You see the other two resolvents. I now fixed my reference guy. So this was the Dirichlet guy. I look at all other separated boundary conditions. That was the restriction here. You see, I'm not looking at periodic and so on. So the coupled ones are not discussed at the moment, but the separated ones, all separated ones, can be compared to Dirichlet on either end. And here you get, well, this is something we saw before. This is this rank one piece. And since we are second order, you get, in fact, exactly two pieces. So this is a rank two situation. And the matrix is known. It involves the boundary conditions, theta 0 and theta r for this guy. And it involves this basis of uh, solutions of the defect subspace. Okay, this use. Okay. Now, here is a little more about... Ah, yeah. Ah, you see, I cheated a little. I had to make two exceptions. I didn't want to be zero here. So it's not a problem. Except this matrix collapses into a one by one, by one matrix. So this is one of the cases where relatively prime plays a role. If uh, one of these angles is zero, these guys are not relatively prime. And so sure enough, the result, oops, wrong direction. The result simplifies a little, you see. if. Theta zero is not zero, but uh, I guess this is the case where theta r is zero. You see, I put x times zero here. So I put one of them zero, but not the other. I don't want to compare the operator with itself. I get, of course, nothing there. It would be zero on the other side. So the special case where theta r is zero, you get the same thing, but it's rank one now. It's not rank two. And you have a function here. The function, I wonder. I didn't write it down. Huh? It's explicitly, oh, here it is. Here it is, right? So this is it. It involves the remaining boundary condition parameter and again, an element of the defect subspace. So it becomes a rank one situation. And the same happens if you turn it around. If you make theta zero to zero and you keep theta r from being zero, you get the same story. You get a rank one right hand side and the object can be identified at, uh, explicitly. So. That's how we apply this, uh, how we get these grind formulas for Schrodinger operators on a 
Hobbak interval. Now, this was the separated case. So I also have the non-separated one. Now life gets a little more interesting. Uh, we have, remember, we had to parameterize it in terms of an SL2R matrix and a phase factor. The phase factor now goes all the way from 0 to 2 pi, uh, 2 pi excluded, and F was an SL2R matrix, so real coefficients determinant plus 1. Anyway, so here's our F, here's our phase factor. Again, we are comparing with this fixed Dirichlet guy as a reference guy. And we want to compare all the other now coupled boundary conditions. Well, here it is. Again, rank 2, because we are... So, there is an assumption here. F1, 2, so the element to the, the right upper element in the 2 by 2 matrix, F should not be 0. You will see in the next uh, slide what happens if it is 0. Again, this collapses into a simpler situation. But in general, so if F12 is not 0, then you can show that the Klein formula looks like this. And a very explicit formula in terms of the matrix elements of this F. Of course, the phase factor V also shows up a few times in this matrix Q and the inverse, of course, in there. Now, this is rank 2. So if we go on and look at the uh, exceptional case, F12 equals 0, sure enough, it collapses into a rank 1 situation. So now you have a scalar here. Well, here's the scalar. Again, it involves all the matrix elements and uh, elements of the defect subspace. Okay. All right. So let me spend a little more now on uh, abstract stuff. So how am I doing with time? I should go until... One, until two. Oh, that's good. So we have 50 minutes. All right. Let's do a little more abstract stuff here. And so I had already mentioned at the beginning that if you have a symmetric closed densely defined operator bounded from below, so let's assume for simplicity it's bounded from below by zero, that Friedrichs and Klein for Neumann extensions are very special uh, extensions. So Non-negativity we had already last time uh, is, of course, defined in, in, in these terms. The matrix element for all elements in the domain has to be non-negative. And since we are eventually going back to a finite interval, we will actually be strictly positive uh, because that's typical for compact interval problems. So strict positivity just means that this inequality is improved by an epsilon and the norm of u squared on the right-hand side. And you would then use the, the symbol T is uh, large or equal to epsilon times the identity. A little warning, you can always introduce also order between operators, but you have to be very careful. You have to do this in a sense of quadratic forms. Right? So there, there are some, some, some differences. Um, it's much easier to order by not using operators, but by using resolvents because then you go to the bounded situation and then there is no issue. We'll come to that in a second. So here's a famous theorem that uh, Mark Crane proved in 1947. So the setup is clear. So we have a non-negative uh, densely defined closed operator. You don't want it to be self-adjoint, so really just symmetric, okay? And then uh, among all the non-negative self-adjoint extensions, there are two distinguished ones. And they are, in a very real sense, extremer. So these are this, this Krein von Neumann and the Friedrichs extension. You can order them in the following sense. So any other non-negative self adjoint extension, S tilde of S, would be in between the two. And in, in between the two, I write now in terms of resolvents, then I don't have to worry. So you see, this is the largest guy. This is the smallest guy, because I, I'm doing resolvents here. Now, if you are actually strictly positive, and we will be on the compact interval, you can do a lot more, much more. You can totally describe all these domains. So let me uh, start perhaps with, let's look at the largest of these operators. So remember we have S, then we have S star. S star is not even symmetric. S is symmetric, but not self-adjoint. So both of them are defective. But let's see how, how much larger the adjoint domain is compared to the domain of S. 
Well, it's the domain of S, direct sum in the sense of Banach spaces, so no orthogonality here. The kernel of S star has to be multiplied by the Friedrich extension inverse. So now you wonder, does this exist? Yes, because here I'm assuming S is strictly positive. Automatically, the Friedrich extension has the same lower bound, epsilon. And therefore, if epsilon is positive, this is a well-defined bounded operator. So of course, we can hit the kernel with it. And then you also should add, in a direct sense, so this is uh, direct sums here and here, the kernel of S star. So that's what this looks like compared to the domain of S. So it's quite a bit larger. If you go to Friedrichs and Krein, you see you get either this part or this part. So for Friedrichs, you get a domain of S and you have to add kernel of S star, hit by SF inverse. But if you do the Krein extension, you just add the kernel of S star. Oh, I mean the following. The intersection of the two uh, vector spaces is the zero vector. Hmm? No, no, that's, a, that, that's part of the definition of uh, direct sum. It's not orthogonal direct sum, like in a... So it means each of these, each of these subspaces has only the zero vector in common. It's a nice partition of the, of the space, of, of, that, of, of that part. Okay? Oh no, Krein proved that. Now he proved that, yes, yes. It's all in his paper from 1947. Fantastic paper, unfortunately. Never been translated. Just a Russian original exists. So you have to have good friends. Unless you speak Russian, of course. Okay, so let me say something else about the null space of uh, the Krein extension. That's perhaps a surprise. So first of all, it's the same as the kernel of the square root. Never mind. But that's interesting. It's actually the full kernel of the adjoint, which is the range of uh, S perpendicular, and therefore it has to do with the defect subspace for energy parameter Z equals zero. Now that's interesting, because this is usually a large object. Now, for ODEs, nothing is large. If you have a second order operator, you will never have more than two solutions. Okay. But for a PDE operator, this is infinite dimensional. Uh, think of the Laplacian for a bounded domain. All the L2 harmonic functions are in the kernel. Uh, there are too many of them. There are infinitely many. Okay. So this is a, a big surprise. Usually you are used to from quantum mechanics. But the Krein extension is really not an object for quantum mechanics. It's actually one for elasticity theory, but that, that's a different story. Uh, so the buckling, there's an abstract buckling problem behind all this. Uh, naturally, in a one-to-one in -one correspondence spectrally with uh, the Krein extension. But quantum mechanics doesn't, that doesn't seem to fit into it because we are used from quantum mechanical systems that the ground state is simple, non-degenerate. This is the opposite. Even in the, in the second order one-dimensional case, this thing will be two-dimensional. So even there it's degenerate. But it is what it is. It's still a very interesting object because every other non-negative surface and extension lies between these two guys. They are extremal points. Okay. Uh, let me just mention two characterizations, direct characterizations of Friedrichs and Krein. One was found, um, I wanted, yes, so Friedrichs was, obviously, uh, the first who found it in 34. Yes, sure. We will get, I'll show you an example. No, 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 that's not. Okay, so there's an interesting story behind this. So Friedrichs found this in 34. In 29, von Neumann wrote his long paper on uh, pretty much everything that uh, he, he more or less created the basis, the mathematical basis for quantum mechanics. In this 29 paper, he introduced the notion of a closed operator, 
we couldn't do spectral theory, we would have to literally invent the notion of closed operators before being able to do spectral theory. He did all that. He did self adjoint extensions. The full, uh, he, uh, he totally understood how you extend the semantic operator to self adjoint extensions. And also, of course, he figured out that there are situations when you cannot extend. So it depends whether the deficiency indices are equal or not. And he did all that for finite and infinite efficiency indices. So the whole story was in there, a, a marvelous paper. He knew about, he, he conjectured the existence of the Friedrich's extension because he knew sort of from examples that's what should, but he wasn't able to prove it. You know what he proved? He proved the existence of the Klein von Neumann extension. So he got the other guy. Now, in a special case where the um, symmetric operator is strictly positive, so there is an epsilon. It's in, in the 1929 paper of von Neumann. Not the general case. The general case, when it's just non negative, is all to Krein from 1947. Anyway, so Friedrich did prove this, what von Neumann didn't do immediately. So, five years later, though. And then, two years later, Freudenthal found what everybody uses today. So, this is the, uh, the quickest characterization. So, you see, it's basically a restriction of the adjoint. So, we're going not extension of the minimal. But the restriction of the maxima. And the restrictions are like this. You take an element so that you can find approximating elements from the domain of S. So you see there's the approximation. So that this scalar product goes to zero. Okay. There's another 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 fact. So the phrase extension is the adjoint restricted to the domain of the adjoint, obviously, and then made smaller by the form domain of S. Okay. Now, look at this, 1970. It took that long, from 47 to 1970, until something similar was found for the Klein von Neumann extension. So that took quite a while. That wasn't obvious. So let me just quickly go through. It looks deceptively similar to that. But there's a huge difference. You're not approximating the element V with Vj, J, but there's an S and an S star here. Otherwise, it looks the same. But of course, that makes all the difference. The two ob objects have nothing in common. Okay. So, let me uh, describe this now back to our concrete case uh, for showing operators on uh, zero R. Um, this is something... Yes. So, this is a little, this, is, this looks abstract, because I have arbitrary coefficients. I haven't, I haven't specialized the coefficients. Once I take the Laplacian alone, you will see how simple it all becomes. But with arbitrary coefficients, you get these elements from the defect subspace everywhere into the game. Okay, so here's the statement. So if you want to describe the Krein von Neumann extension versus the Dirichlet extension, or well, you have a Klein formula, so you would, in this case it's either two by two matrix, nothing collapses, it's a rank two situations, and here's the uh, situation for, for Q. The phase that we had was actually zero, you don't need the phase. The SL2R matrix is two by two and of this form here, and the corresponding Q that you see in here, actually the inverse stands in there, is given in terms of this. You see now, this is already your, an answer to your question. It depends on the interval. Yeah. Oh, B, Q, and R. I didn't... The, or, or the Schrodinger, but in any case, if you, if you give V, if you give V just arbitrary as an L1 log function, you cannot do anything. But you can express it in terms of these elements of the defect. Yes, correct. But if I make a very special choice, so if I put P equals 1, R equals 1, and Q equals 0, oh, then I can do it all. And I think I have this uh, in a minute. Anyway, so this is the situation for crying. And you again, you can see the R is everywhere. So yes, it depends on the length of the interval. But we will see this much more concrete. So here it is, finally. You see the special case V equals zero. Just a Laplacian, but with a Krein boundary condition. 
what is it? Well, these elements in the defect subspace at, at x z equals zero are linear combinations of one and x. Those are the harmonic functions, after all, one and x, okay, for a second order situation. And you have to choose them like that. Then uh, you can see that uh, the boundary condition, there's no phi, there's no phase here. Yeah, indeed, we knew the phase was zero. Here's the matrix F, which becomes very simple. One, one, zero, length of the interval, the right endpoint. And now look at this, this is the boundary condition. Very strange. When I saw this the first time, I didn't believe it was self-adjoint. So I checked. Yes, it is self-adjoint. Of course it is. But it, it looks unreal. So U prime has to be U prime. So at either end point, U prime at R is a U prime at zero. Okay. That almost looks like periodic. But no. Then this should be the same as U of R minus U of zero divided by the length of the interval. Okay. So that's the concrete boundary. Again, who would have guessed that? It's pretty actually once you think about it and once you think in terms of these harmonic functions it becomes quite obvious but if it you have to start somewhere and if you have no experience with this thing it's going to be a surprise at first okay so yeah yeah the linear combinations of x and, and the constants so it's it's definitely the kernel is two dimensional, it's two dimen so it's not it's not it's not uh, not simple the ground state. Okay, now I want to uh, move to the actual boundary data maps. So that's uh, the analog of Dirichlet and Neumann maps. UC has actually mentioned that quite a bit, but as the name Dirichlet and Neumann map says, you use a Dirichlet and you use a Neumann boundary condition. Now I want to use anything at least anything in the context of uh, separated boundary conditions. Oops, sorry for that. Oh, here we are. So I'm going to work with separate boundary conditions. We can also do any boundary conditions. And in the re three references I mentioned at the very beginning, one of the papers do is, is concerned with every self adjoint boundary condition. But let's keep life a little simpler. And let's just work, first of all, again, with Schrodinger operators, so just one coefficient and separated boundary conditions. So here's what I define. I define a boundary trace map. That's a, a very uh, sophisticated name for a trivial object. Uh, and you, I don't understand, still don't understand, why people ever call this a trace map. I understand you're taking restrictions to a boundary. But a trace is, the spectral trace is a totally different object, and people should not have abused uh, the same name for it, but they did. It's, it's stuck, and so now we are stuck with this strange object that... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I, as a spectral theorist, I object, but it's too late. <laughs> okay, so what is it? Let's do it simple. Let's take C1 functions, map them into vectors, so C2. And so the function u is mapped into this vector here. So you see there are combinations of u, u0 and u prime at 0 with a sine and a cosine, exactly what you saw in the boundary conditions. And the same thing at the, at the right end point. Now, you might wonder why plus and minus. Well, it's a normal derivative. And so it, it, uh, it, the, the left and right end point have different, uh, have different directions. So you compensate with one minus for that. Okay. So it looks strange, but it's totally natural. Okay, now here's my uh, differential equation. These are the technical conditions, so this makes sense. And this is uh, uh, what I look at. So this boundary value problem, so you want to solve the differential equation with this arbitrary C0, CR here prescribed. My claim is has a unique solution. And so what I call the boundary data or Robin or, or Robert, who knows, uh, to Robert map is actually just the following thing. So it's a map that takes these values, so C0 and CR, into these values here. Okay, so the boundary data of U uh, with the corresponding boundary conditions. Right, so the solution here is exactly this guy, which solves 
this problem. Okay, the unique solution, that's the one you use and you apply our boundary trace map on it. Well, you get a vector like that. Okay, so you can actually unravel all this and it becomes a, a fairly uh, explicit uh, explicit thing so uh, when you when you compute it you actually get uh, lambda on such an object and using the definition of the boundary trace map you just get this on the right hand side okay so it's a two by two complex uh, matrix let me give you some examples here uh, Let's look at the Dirichlet and the Neumann case in particular because those are the most familiar ones. So, for instance, a Dirichlet race would have zero zero, of, of course, and the Neumann race would have uh, basically pi over two, pi over two. But because of signs, you have to worry a little. So, three pi over two, three pi over two is is, is better in this context. And so, the Dirichlet and Neumann map, so lambda d n, would correspond to zero here, pi over two there, and uh, in essence, u at 0 and u at r is mapped into u prime at 0 and minus because of the direction changes of u prime at r. There's actually some older results that have studied this. There's also a paper by Mark Malamud from 92. Other than that, I haven't found anything on ODEs before we got interested in this. I must say that my interest uh, came about in a strange way. So I had uh, worked quite a bit uh, since 2005 on Dirichlet and Neumann maps for, and Robin, the Robin maps for PDs. And at one time I decided to step back and figure out what's that for ODs. And so this is actually what you see here, the result of that. So then it didn't exist in full generality as far as I can, can tell. Okay, so I guess this we had already, so I'm going to go fast here. Oh, maybe not, not entirely. Let me, uh, this is something you saw in some sense already, but I want to uh, connect it now with this boundary data map. So remember the self-adjoint extensions, we decided we had all of them, were either of separated nature, and then you can write the boundary conditions in terms of a matrix A and a matrix B, that looks a little strange, but it is exactly, if you unravel it, these are the two boundary conditions we had in the separated case, or you use this fact here again with the phase and the SL2R matrix. So this is nothing new, it's just a, a, a strange way of rewriting what we had earlier. But if you look at this here, now you see, you can actually connect this, uh, uh, so this matrices A and B, they can now be incorporated into boundary data maps, so very general ones. And so now I go from a C1 function to a vector by having the matrix A from the boundary condition and then the matrix B from the boundary condition built into it. Okay? So this is at zero and this is at R. Uh, there are ways of these are actually not so simple objects, and so it makes sense to try to reduce them to a Dirichlet and to a Neumann trace map, and this can be done. And so there are, in terms of these matrices A and B, you actually have formulas for this. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, this is also uh, something I will need at the, at the next, uh, next page. So this is a definition. So these matrices here are combined in this, uh, in this form. And they will they will show up a little later when we uh, go to go back to Krein type formulas. Okay, so here is now the general uh, situation. So again, we are solving an initial value problem here. So you see, here is the same differential equation, the usual technical assumptions, but now we have general boundary data maps here, not just separated boundary conditions. This all looks the same. There is a unique solution. I, I put the C1 and C2 in there because it's part of the of the solution. And again, the the new general boundary data map that maps from boundary conditions parameterized by A and B to boundary conditions parameterized by A prime and B prime. So think, for instance, 
this could be Dirichlet, this could be Neumann, then it's a Dirichlet and Neumann case, but uh, this is now the, the most general possibility here. Does the same thing again, it, 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 it maps into the solution of this problem with the trace map in front. Okay? Here are a few, a few formulas for, for these uh, maps and one that I like in particular. So that's the most interesting piece on this page, but let's do it uh, more systematically. So what are the properties of these guys? Well, this is what they were. You know, this is in terms of Dirichlet and Neumann maps and these matrices we just saw. Well, if you go from AB to AB, nothing changes. You get the identity, that's obvious. But look at this nice transitivity property. If I want to go from AB to A double prime and B double prime, you can do this in steps. You go from AB to A prime, B prime, and then from A prime, B prime to A double prime, B double prime. So this is a very nice transitivity property. And of course, if you insist on interchanging AB and A prime, B prime, well, then you get the inverse. That's, that's obvious. So let me uh, describe this now for this uh, Schrodinger or Sturm Liouville, it really makes no difference whether it's one coefficient or three coefficient. But here's a formula that apart from this S, we just saw this, I said I, I will need this in a minute, so let me go back to it. This is the S and, and the S, the, its R joint will be, it's just a fixed, a fixed matrix, so don't worry too much about it. It comes from the boundary condition matri matrices A and B. So apart from such a strange matrix, our generalized boundary data map, so the very general one from AB to A prime, B prime, look what you can do. You can write it as resolvent coming from AB and then two boundary trace maps. Really, you, this is a mathematically correct expression but you should think of it in a, in a different way, which is sloppy and not correct, but is really giving you the idea. Remember, uh, I don't know whether, yeah, here it says, this guy is a Neumann-Lena Herglotz matrix. So again, it's analytic in the open upper half plane with a non-negative imaginary part, okay? Now, what is this really saying? This says, we are having a resolvent and the resolvent is the prime example of an operator-valued Nevan linear function. If it's the resolvent of a self-adjoint operator, which it is in this case, HAB is a self-adjoint extension. So just try this out, use the Specker theorem or just use the, the resolvent equation. The imaginary part of any resolvent of a, a self-adjoint operator is non-negative, okay? So, and what really happens is here, you have the trace map on one side and the trace map adjoint on the other side. So if you take a Herglotz, uh, um, I should say Nevan Lina matrix or operator, and you multiply it by T from one side and by T star from the other, it stays Nevan Lina. Okay? That's what's happening here, except the adjoint of this guy does not exist. That's why I cannot write this as gamma resolvent gamma star, which I would like to do, but I can't. But this is a good, good substitute. It's good enough. Okay. Uh, this is one of the examples where adjoints don't, so if you, if you want, if you ever want to find uh, reasonable examples of operators having no adjoints, Trace maps are actually your, your, a perfect example, and so one has to finesse it. But this is a perfectly uh, acceptable solution because gamma is, of course, relatively bounded with respect to this thing, and then this is a bounded operator, and you can take the adjoint without, without any penalty. But think of it as T resolvent T star. That's really what it is. Okay. Well... So here's another corollary of this type. So you see another, another version of Krein's resolving formula. Here's the P even. I use the same notation here. And the interesting thing now is, and so this gives, gives uh, this shows that these boundary data maps are not just uh, someone's invention. No, they are actually natural because except for this S again, 
which is just a constant matrix. There's no spectral information in it. The lambda and the p are the same. You see? Let me make one more point and go back for a second. You see, this is very interesting because uh, this was also a big part of Yussi's talk. The spectrum is sitting here. Okay? So this guy, this is Z independent. This doesn't know anything. We can ignore it. But this guy, except for the effect of possibly the, the bad adverse effects of trace maps, which one has to prove to not happen, and uh, you see talked about this, the spectral, is, the spectral information is sitting in this object, right, because of the resolvement. So it's a fundamental object. Okay, and so here is the explicit uh, connection between P in the, the Krein formula, the abstract one, and now concrete for our either one or three coefficient second order operators. Okay, so here's a bit more of that. But I think I'm going to move on. Um, yes, so let me show you just one of these as a typical result. So here is uh, here's a possibility to uh, finesse this resolvement equations a bit. So again, you have a difference of two self-adjoint extensions. So you have AB here and A prime B prime. And again, you see the difference is well, there are some trace maps and some resolvents, so this is sort of resolvent equation. In the middle sits my lambda and, of course, this S star. Okay? And uh, there are different situations. Either this guy is invertible, then you get this formula. If it's not invertible, you get a slightly simpler, a sli slightly simpler version. But all these cases can be and have been worked out. Okay. Now we're getting closer to uh, Krein spectral shift functions, so I'll, I'll see, uh, yeah, well, time is running, but I, I think I can do this. So, let me now compute the trace of a resolvent difference. Two self-adjoint extensions, so AB and A prime B prime. I want to compute the trace. It turns out, and that is another reason why lambda is a fundamental con uh, concept, it's simply the logarithmic derivative of the determinant of this, bound, this general boundary data map. Okay? So, uh, and those of you who remember my first lecture will realize this, this immediately gives connection to Klein spectral shift functions, of course, and we'll, we'll see this in a, in a, mi in a minute. So, so, proving this formula really convinced us that this guy is important, right? Because for any, any self adjoint extensions, Separated or not, uh, the trace of the resolvent difference is, is characterized in terms of this boundary data map. Okay, so here is something about. Yeah, should we really go through this? I don't know. Maybe we. This is about symmetrized perturbation determinants. I think I'm going to try to avoid this. So let's finally go to Krein's uh, trace formula in this context. So this is something, uh, again, repeating a bit, a bit from, my, from my first lecture. So since we are bounded from below, we can normalize our Krein spectral shift function to be zero below the spectra of the two operators. And the trace can be computed in terms of Xi. Right? But Xi is an L1 function if you weigh the Lebesgue measure appropriately with 1 over lambda squared plus 1. So that was something we did in, in the first lecture on Monday. Uh, some aspects of it have also been used on, on Wednesday, but this is basically going back to Monday. So there's nothing new to you now. And here is now the connection between lambda and that Krein spectral shift function we just saw, you see? Apart from a little factor here, which is a strange thing, but it doesn't contain anything. You just have to keep tracks of some phases here, apparently. The uh, limit to the real axis and the argument, im log is argument, right? Properly normalized gives you xi. So again, that's a good, uh, a good uh, reason to believe in uh, the importance of lambda. Okay. 
I think I'm gonna run through this and leave all this out. There's a little of inverse spectral theory here, uh, Borg Levinson and so on, but I think I'm going to go. I have only 20 minutes left, so I'll. I think, or am I, am I wrong? About 20, huh? So I'll, I'll do a little of this last part. So this is based on uh, joint work with Yusi and uh, Shun Nakamura. And I should say that the pages you get, you see now after this uh, slide, I got them from Yusi. Yusi gave a talk about this a little earlier and he was kind uh, enough to uh, borrow his, his slides. Uh, and you will also very soon see that he's more sophisticated than I am because he uses two colors for his blocks. So anyway, we'll get there. So the idea is talk a bit about an extension of the spectral shift function in terms of an operator. So there is actually an object like a spectral shift operator whose trace would equal the spectral shift function. Uh, you can make a connection of this spectral shift operator with abstract while ditch mesh operators. So this is something that did play quite a role in uh, uses stokes. And if there is time, I'll uh, sketch the applications to PDs. And if there's no time, that's fine. It's gonna be on the uh, internet anyway, so it will be posted soon. Okay, so this is what I meant with two colors. Actually, you can see it uh, on these two screens mu much nicer. So this is the traditional one, and this is, uh, UC has a variant of it. And so I uh, decided to, to steal that too. Anyway, so what are the general hypotheses from now on? Two self adjoint operators in general unbounded. H, our usual complex Hilbert space. Uh, so here is again a very quick, this is Yusi's summary of uh, Krein's spectral shift functions. So you can see the most important thing is you can compute traces of functions of differences in terms of a derivative of that function and the Krein spectral shift function. So it's really a remarkable object. I mean, who would expect that you can comp that you can do this, right? I mean, it's 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 quite amazing. So here is uh, again, this is just a warm up. So the trace of we saw this main, uh, on Monday. Then uh, then again, uh, you see it here. So the trace of resolving differences is basically linear of c over lambda minus c squared. Um, there's large classes of fees. I, I mentioned on Monday, Pella. Vladimir Pella has pretty much the best results on uh, the largest possible class in terms of base of spaces. Uh, if you have an interval that does not intersect the, uh, the closure of it does not intersect the essential spectrum, then in fact you're counting eigenvalues. Okay, so it's a difference of eigenvalue counting functions. We mentioned that also on Monday. Okay, uh, all of this we have seen. Yeah, let me just remind you very quickly of this marvelous beermann krein formula that this determinant of the scattering matrix, so fixed energy scattering happens here, is actually given by e to the 2 pi i, the spectral shift function. Okay, so let's move on a little. Um, here is uh, a result uh, that Koplienko established in 71. So you assume you have not the resolvents, but powers of resolvents in the trace class. Okay? And then uh, because you're bounded from below, this is not an issue. If you don't have a spectral gap, then you have to go through these complicated double operator integral methods that I mentioned on Wednesday, and a bit also on uh, Monday, the second, the last part. But if you're bounded from below, you don't have these problems. Okay, so life is much simpler in, in this case now. And then, of course, you get something, what you expect, you get the derivative of this function. So here's the derivative and there's xi. And xi now does not satisfy integrability with lam the lambda divided by one plus lambda squared. No, now you need to take the m into account. So it's if m is one, well, you get the square. But if m is not one, you have a higher uh, power weight here or inverse power here. Okay. Um, yeah, five looked into this uh, about 12 years ago. Actually, some of his results were really geared towards not being bounded from below. So for the rock type operators, in fact, 
that's the, the main application for this. And so, uh, but if we assume boundedness from below, which I said I would do from the outset, we get similar things here and uh, uh, there's really not uh, that much difference, except this, is a, this has a much wider scope than uh, the original paper by Komplienko. So here it is, is mentioned. So yeah, five does not assume boundedness from below. Okay, yeah. Oh, am I erasing it? No, I, ha I guess I have not yet. <laughs> Sorry, Lada. <laughs> oh, that's what worries you. Nah, I'm okay. <laughs> I was afraid I would erase the board. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, this is sort of this is a remarkable uh, uh, strength of your five's paper. He doesn't need anything; it can be the whole real axis, and we use that as the basis for our continuity result of spectral shift functions that I talked about in the second part on on uh, Monday. Okay, so here is uh, very briefly what uh, Yussi actually told you many many times. Now uh, I think he used it in. In, in almost all of his lectures. So this is this boundary triple approach again. So you have a symmetric operator, closed, deficiency indices, infinite. Uh, he, he, we are going after PDEs, so to speak. And then there's this quasi-boundary triple with the usual properties. So there was always this discussion that the closure, so T is close to S star, but not quite. You want the closure of T to be S star. So you see made made a big point of that. So all, all of this you have seen. Um, here's an example that you also saw in connection with UC. So S could be the uh, Schrodinger operator, there's a potential, where you put everything zero. So the, the restriction of the boundary and the normal, the, uh, and the normal derivative, uh, so all things vanish. I think there is a, there's a typo here, something went wrong here. What we mean to say is that the Dirichlet and the Neumann traces are vanishing. But somehow, oh, it's okay. So this is the Dirichlet trace and this is the Neumann trace. Sorry, I confused myself. Everything's fine. The adjoint is too big, not even symmetric. There's no boundary condition here. Well, the, uh, the T that uh, we are discussing here is then this guy with H2. And you have a Green's formula that was discussed by... by uh, by UC. And this, uh, the concrete objects here would be L2 of the boundary and then uh, restriction and restriction of the normal derivative, right? This is gamma 0 and gamma 1. So this, this is also basically what UC talked about. So here now comes the gamma field and the uh, while function. Uh, again, there is an example uh, and you can see that uh, this is, uh, in essence, an energy-dependent Dirichlet, the Neumann map. Okay. So, I guess I can go a little faster here. What do we have here? Well, this is interesting. This is pretty much the analog of some of the formulas I showed you in the ODE context. Remember what we said? So, in this context, uh, the adjoint makes sense, and you actually get directly uh, that the difference of resolvance of A and B, the two self-adjoint extensions, is related to, well, I called it lambda, now it's uh, the abstract while function, and you have a trace operator here, and the adjoint on the other side. So that's one, one fundamental formula in this context. That's the real reason why gamma and M are so important, because they allow you to describe pairs of self-adjoint extensions. So here is then an idea of, uh, well, implicitly, there is a spectral shift operator here. And it's basically this operator M, because you see what I'm doing, I take the argument and then a trace and I get my Krein spectral shift function. So that's what I said at the beginning, you can extend the notion of a spectral shift function to a spectral shift operator whose trace is a spectral shift function, okay? And so this is exactly what's happening here in terms of this abstract while function. Again, this is just a repeat, we just saw the resolvent equation. 
one can show the imaginary part of the log of m is trace class, therefore this makes sense. And if you go through all the arguments, you realize that this limit, this is a normal limit to the real axis for almost every lambda. Non-tangential would be just as well. Gives you the grind spectrum for this pair of operators A and B. And so here's again once more the trace formula for the resorbance, which we saw so many times. Okay, let me uh, do this a bit quick here. So uh, this is in this. This has to do with certain properties of. Uh, uh, so so this is actually a set of assumptions here. So we need uh, we want order. Then we want boundedness. We want certain objects to be a trace class or in a trace ideal. You see, there's a fractional thing here and with that we can uh, do the f oh somehow this didn't work oh here we go no just a second i think i must have jumped no yeah i must have jumped over this page so this was this wasn't something i wanted to do so let me quickly uh, say something about the logarithm that enters the game. Uh, it's non-trivial to define the logarithm of these functions and it's possible because in some sense these are dissipative operators so the imaginary part of M is non-negative. It's a special class of non-self-adjoint operators which allows a bit of a functional calculus. So the way you do this actually is you look at an integral representation in terms of the resolvent of M. So this in itself is a rather interesting uh, object in the a key difficulty is to really make sense out of this. Um, yes, and then what uh, some of the experts here will remember is an exponential Herglotz representation. And you can see this here. So the logarithm of m. m is an even linear function. Log is an even linear function. Compositions of even linear functions are even linear functions. So log of m is even linear. And it's a very nice naval linear function. It comes with an absolutely continuous, if you want, operator valued measure. Because there's a density operator, that's the spectral shift operator times the lambda. And here's that Cauchy kernel that I at one point mentioned today with this measure representation. So normally when you just take a naval linear function, you get a representation like this, but with a complicated measure. This is very special. So this has to do with the the, the logarithm being a bounded function in the upper half plane. Okay, so, but I mean the argument being bounded in the imaginary part. Okay, so let me move on from here. No, I don't think we should think it, there's no operator behind whose spectrum this, this would describe. So this is really just an Neyman linear representation with a measure that's special. Okay? But it is not, it doesn't say that. Uh, I have an absolutely continuous operator valued measure. Th that's all I would, would, would say. Ah, it comes from the fact that the imaginary part, let's see, how does this go? Uh, there's a very simple argument for that. Yes, whenever the imaginary part of your neighbor linear function is bounded, it's always non-negative, so it's bounded on one side by zero. If it's also bounded on the other side, the measure in the representation is absolutely continuous. In our case, the argument is pi because our, our angle goes from zero to pi, and so pi is the upper, upper bound. If you divide by pi, actually, which you always do in this uh, argument arguments, you, you get a bound by one. So see the operator is bounded actually by the identity operator. What, what which A? Well, it, it, it's a function of both. They were, they were, oh no, no, but we had, we had, uh, we had all sorts of trace. Look, there was quite a few, there were quite a few assumptions, you see. So there's quite a bit of stuff here.
Sure, sure. What are the... Yes, let, let, let me say the following. Every time you look at the naval linear function and you take its logarithm, the measure will be absolutely continuous, whether it's a scalar measure, a matrix measure, or an operator measure. Okay? It's this what the angles go from zero to pi, and that, that's 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 the boundedness here, okay? Okay, so there is a little bit of literature, but you can can read of this uh, uh, at the at the archive. So let me yeah, actually, I have three or so minutes, so I can actually finish this. Even that was a bit fast, but here's a, the first example. We're looking at uh, Robin boundary conditions, so we want to apply this to, to, to such a situation where beta 0 and beta 1 are the Robin or Robert functions. Does anyone know? Is it Robin or is it Robert? Nobody knows. Shame on us. <laughs> okay, anyway, so we are dealing with a domain for simplicity. The uh, boundary is compact and smooth. The potential is real, valid, and L infinity. The functions are nice, so C2 in this case on the boundary, that's all on the boundary, real. And we don't want them equal, we want to compare operators so they better be different. Uh, and I mentioned the Neumann to Dirichlet map, which we now in this case denote by N, and it maps, uh, anyway, data, Neumann data to, to Dirichlet data. So with appropriate powers here, we can show the difference of these two Robin operators or resolvents with appropriate powers is actually trace class. So we have satisfied that one of these assumptions. The spectral shift function can be given in terms of another im log, so argument and the trace, and of course normalized by one over pi, uh, in terms of this m0 and m1, which are given here. So this is a uh, hiding here in the line below. The j0 or 1, somewhere it says that. So it's this guy or that guy. And you basically play, it's a fractional transformation of the uh, Neumann uh, to Dirichlet map, okay? With the betas uh, in there. So that's one possibility. And then there's a second example. So these are my last two pages, I believe. Hard to believe, it seems I, make, I, I made it. So we have uh, Laplace and now a potential. So sharding operator, free sharding operator, uh, nice enough potential that the domain is H2, L infinity will do. It's of course uh, not necessary, but certainly sufficient. And uh, I guess the potential is bounded, has compact support in the in the ball. So this is uh, a fixed open ball. Okay. Now what uh, what's done here is. So this is sort of an, a way of uh, decomposing the problem into several. Uh, let's look at this here. So L2 of Rn is decomposed in terms of L2 of the ball and the outside of the ball. So this is the exterior. And uh, with S, the common boundary of these two sets. So that's the boundary of the ball. Then these objects that you see, so A and B were the ones we started with, but now suddenly we have all sorts of other objects. So C, A plus, B plus, and so on, they are defined here. So A plus is the Laplacian um, in uh, L2 of the ball, B plus is uh, the same here with the potential, and C is uh, the Laplacian, but now in uh, the intersection of, you see, now we are in the exterior of the ball, okay? And uh, uh, all these problems, yes. And so for the spectral pair B plus and A plus, they are, they are only in the ball. And for them, the C is, of course, the difference of the eigenvalue counting function, because this, these two problems have discrete spectrum only. Okay? So, but it's a special case. It's not A and B. It's B, A plus and B plus. Okay, so to finish this up, here's the theorem. So again, if k is uh, large enough, you have the corresponding difference of powers of resolvents in the trace class. You have a spectral shift function that can be written now in terms of these two m functions, if you want. Again, there's an argument, there's a trace. There's also a contribution from the difference of the eigenvalue counting functions that we just saw for a plus and b plus. Those are the two guys in the ball. 
n is defined here and v the second guy is defined here and uh, never mind this i is a uh, I'll, I'll come to it in a second and uh, so d plus minus r d the the normal maps for these objects okay in the ball and in the complement n is arbitrary yep and so uh, here's just a brief description this eyes that you see they're actually a little tricky so there's a there's an explanation for them but i don't want to get into details let me just show you where they showed up so they are part of this n and nv okay so this i and the i tilde the one needs to explain a little and this is done in this paragraph so the last bit drama plays a role never mind um i think i'm gonna stop at this point thank you very much <laughs> Okay. Oh, this here? Yeah, that's J. Simplectic stuff, typically. Yes. Now, do you want your point interactions in the middle of the interval? Okay, so no one has developed a theory unless it's part of UC stuff. I, 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 I agree, one could do it, but, but no one, I don't think anyone has. So I, I, I certainly have not. Uh, is it doable? Yes, I would think it's absolutely doable. Yeah, sure. Anytime you're bounded from below, it makes sense to talk about the Klein extension. You just then look at the non-negative self-adjoint extensions. Not all, just the non-negative ones. But once you're bounded from below, they do exist. 